So here in our Project Lead the Way Aerospace Engineering class, we're going to take a look at forces of flight and stability. We're going to break this up into two parts. And thanks again to PLTW for the content. So forces on an aircraft are basically just four. And we're going to take a look at each of those. So when an aircraft's in flight, and here we just see a a fighter aircraft, there are four basic components or four forces. One, obviously, is the weight. And we know from science that weight is just mass times gravitational acceleration, and that always points towards Earth. To counteract that, an aircraft creates lift from the wings. Thrust is generated by the engines. that propel it forward, whether that's a jet aircraft as we see here, or a propeller-driven aircraft that moves the aircraft forward. And the force that opposes thrust is drag. So let's take a look at a little bit closer of what force is. So force is a vector, which means that it has both magnitude and direction. So a good way to think about that is something you know, something you can relate to. So you're in the bus or the car on the way to school and someone asks you how fast you're going. You look down at the speedometer and it says 35 miles per hour. Well, that's your magnitude, but unless you say I'm going 35 miles per hour north, it's just a scalar. So when you say 35 miles an hour north, that then is a vector because it has both magnitude and direction. Well, we can write 35 miles an hour north or we can represent vectors with arrows. So one way to do that when we draw graphically representing vectors is the length of the arrow represents the magnitude. So the longer the arrow, the greater the magnitude, but the arrow also indicates direction. So here we have force going to the right, force going to the left. So the question is, which one has the greater magnitude? What's well, the longer one? Force one, of course. But now let's uh, let's dig a little bit deeper. So here we have those same two arrows, one to the right and one to the left, and we've assigned some numbers to them. So remember, forces are either in newtons in the SI system or metric system or in pounds force in the U.S. customary system. So here we have a uh, force going east, and we know it's going east because we have there uh, a little compass, if you will, up is north. So if up is north, East is to the right, south is to the bottom, left is to the west. So we have a uh, question, what direction is force one? Well, obviously that's to the east. What direction is force two? It's to the west. So if we apply two forces to an object, let's say a box, what's gonna happen? Well, they're gonna be imbalanced. So there's a net force. So that net force we call a resultant. And what happens is if there's a net force, a positive net force, that means that that aircraft or that object, in this case a, um, a yellow square, is going to move and it's going to accelerate. So, but what if the resultant is zero? In this case we have balanced forces, so when they are opposite in direction and opposite in magnitude, the resultant force is zero. So a special term we use for that condition is called static equilibrium. So what happens to uh, an airplane? So an airplane needs to move from A to B. What has to happen? Well, we have to apply a force in the direction from A to B, and we call that, of course, thrust. Right, And when we apply a thrust, what happens if it is in equilibrium? The thrust has to equal the drag. So drag acts opposite of the thrust. And if it's in equilibrium, thrust equals drag, which I mentioned, it has constant velocity. That doesn't mean it's not moving, it just means it's not accelerating. So how do you increase acceleration? Well, you have to either either increase the thrust, 
or decrease the drag, or in the case of Newton's second law equation, which is F equals MA, you have to decrease the mass. So let's look a little bit more at some of these forces. So weight. So weight, of course, pulls uh, aircraft down, and we need something to, to counteract that. So we want to take a look at a little bit more how uh, an aircraft weight is distributed and where to find the center of gravity. So we need some sort of reference point, and we typically choose uh, something called the firewall. So one thing about weight and balance is it's super duper important to know what your weight is and if it's balanced properly uh, or you're not going to have a, a safe flight. So one of the things we look at, we could look at the front of the aircraft, but we need some sort of reference point. Uh, and the reference point that we're going to use uh, in almost any instance when we're looking at an aircraft is the firewall. So the firewall is that place between the power plant and the cockpit. Um, cars have a firewall, a lot of different vehicles have a firewall. So we have to look at the total weight and its location. So question here is what weight makes up an aircraft? So obviously there's the weight of the aircraft, uh, the pilots and passengers, the cargo, and of course the fuel. Fuel is a big component of weight. But how do we know if it's distributed properly? Let's take a look at something called a moment. Let's take a moment to review the moments. We're not talking about a moment in time. We're talking about a moment is defined as a force times a distance. Um, here, distance in parentheses means it's multiplied. So uh, a common term for moment in everyday language is called torque. So you might know how to use a wrench or apply a wrench. So a really important thing to know about moments is the moment is the force times the distance, but that distance has to be perpendicular to the line of action. So here we have a wrench and we have our line of action and it's rotating uh, about that rotation point. That distance though has to be perpendicular. If I have a if I have a, a force going this way, my perpendicular distance is actually here because it it follows, it's perpendicular to that line of action. So let's take a look then at how those forces is, forces are distributed. So we have the different weights in the left. So there's the empty weight of the aircraft. There's the pilot, co-pilot, fuel, and so on. And you can see in the second column we have our forces and our arm distance. So that arm distance represents the distance from the datum or the front uh, front face of the firewall, and we need to calculate the moments. So our moments have to balance our overall forces. So if we take a look at that and we add some numbers, if we sum all the, the weights, it's 2400, and then we add the moments. So if we look at the top here, the top right, we have 54,604 inch-pounds. It's very important to get the the units right there. If we multiply 1,460 pounds and the distance arm from the center of gravity of the aircraft, the distance from there to the firewall is 37.4 inches. We multiply those two numbers to get the 54,604 inch pounds. Then we have to do that for each of the components. And then when we add those up, we get 104,000. Okay, well, so that's great. Now what? Well, there, there is an envelope, a safe operating envelope. So this is called a weight and balance chart, and it's found in a Pilot Operational Handbook. I believe this is for uh, Cessna 172. So here's how this works. If a 
if your weight and balance, your calculation is within this envelope, then you're pretty much safe to fly. If the center of gravity lies too far back, the aircraft is inclined to probably pitch up, your nose is going to pitch up, you might need, that, that would tend to stall your aircraft, you don't want that. If it's too far forward, then you're probably going to have to, uh, your aircraft is going to pitch down and you're constantly going to be, as a pilot, pulling on your, pulling back on your yoke. So you want it to be balanced. If it's not, you may have some uh, unsafe situations. You may have flown, for example, in a, a small aircraft where uh, a flight attendant or a pilot may have asked people to change seats, and that's what they're doing. They're looking at uh, the weight and balance of the aircraft. Here's an example of where the CG lies just on the line. You do that weight and uh, balance calculation, and it's right on the line. And is it safe to fly? Yeah, but you don't want to get too crazy with your maneuvers. Another thing to notice is that the slope on the upper limit is different than the lower limit. If you look at that front line, um, and that comes from this line, these lines and these graphs come from actual flight tests and calculations that aerospace engineers do. So this graph is a little bit different look. It's very similar to what you looked at. So this is a safe operating envelope. It's a different kind of graph though. So if you look at the bottom, it says center of gravity percent MAC. MAC is mean aerodynamic chord. And that's represented as a percent of the total chord. So for example, um, if you had 0%, that would be at the front leading edge of the the wing and mean aerodynamic chord is the average chord so remember the chord is the line that goes from the leading edge to the trailing edge and we say mean chord because if you look at the chord at the root of the wing right next to the fuselage it's probably in a lot of cases bigger or greater than the cord at the wing tip in case of a tapered wing. So that's why we use mean aerodynamic cord. Um, and it's pretty common for the center of gravity to be located somewhere in that wing. So that's why this graph looks at on the bottom center of gravity percent MAC. And then on the vertical axis, you see zero fuel weight. So that's uh, another term for that is empty weight. So you can see where it's safe to operate this aircraft, which I don't know uh, exactly which aircraft this is. But it's another way to look at uh, operational envelope and safety. So here's probably some better graphics that I think uh, will ex help explain it a little bit better uh, looking at an actual aircraft instead of tables and graphs. So here we have an aircraft that's that's pretty well balanced. You see the red CG, that's the center of gravity for the entire aircraft. And then you see a blue CL. So that represents the center of lift. Uh, another term for it is center of pressure. So that is, you take the sum of all of the aerodynamic forces on the airplane and, and you put those at, you calculate where that uh, ends up. And so that ends up right near the center of gravity. And that's actually what you want. You don't want those to be too far apart. Otherwise, you get a torque or a moment on the airplane that can be dangerous. So uh, in the back, you'll notice that you use the, the horizontal stabilizer as uh, to control your pitch. So vertical forces acting on an airplane, this is a great representation of that. Well, what happens if your center of gravity is too far back? That can create a dangerous situation, as you see here. So the center of lift is forward, so it's going to make that nose pitch up. So what that means is you're going to have to have your horizontal 
stabilizer or your elevator, you're going to have to really have that, have a lot of force on that to try to keep the nose down. So at some point, there will, there will be a point where if your center of gravity moves too far back, you cannot control your airplane. So I think this is a good representation of kind of how to think through that. Similarly, if you have your center of gravity too far forward, you're going to have to deflect the elevator the other way because your nose is going to want to pitch down. And again, if that moves too far forward, you won't be able to control your aircraft. So again, thanks to PLTW and these fine folks for providing the information on this presentation.